Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. My name is Jackson Mummy, and each week we'll be bringing you updated information about the bar exam and what you need to do in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Ready to get started? Let's jump to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It is our resumption of the Q&A webinar and podcast for Celebration Bar Review leading up to the July 2024 exam. If you're with us live today, we're glad to have you here. With me today is Judge Tracy Dawson. Tracy, good to see you. And oh, no. Glad to be here. Excited. Glad to be back. Yeah, this is fun. June, Brianna, Amanda, Bobka, they're not going to be with us today. They'll be back in April when we resume really digging in for real into the July 2024 exam. Tracy, what we're going to talk about today, we've got a, a, a fair number of, of topics on our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about what was tested, as far as we know, in the February 2024 exams around the country. We're also going to talk about getting started with the July 2024 exams and how to get yourself underway with that part of the work. We're also going to spend some time talking about our upcoming live boot camp for bar prep coming up in Denver, April 26th and 27th. And we're also going to update you on the next generation bar exam and some changes that are being made around the country on the current, what we're actually now calling the legacy bar exam. Is that right? That's right. Legacy. So suddenly the existing bar exam has become the legacy bar exam. We're going to talk about some changes that have just been announced there. And then also I'm going to talk a little bit about our new video critique program. So there's several things that we've got coming up. So I think where we're going to start today is to talk a little bit about the February 2024 exams and what we know so far. The exams were, in general, I would characterize as being pretty fair. This was not the worst set of exams. In fact, it was actually pretty straightforward in most situations. And I'm really pleased to see that. I think that we're going to see pretty good results from our students based on the feedback that we got after the exams. I wanted to just go through the jurisdictions a little bit and talk about what we understand to have been tested. I will say that we did not get a lot of feedback in Georgia, so I'm not going to give you any subject matter in terms of Georgia. I can tell you that our Georgia students felt pretty good about the exam, but it's uh, we don't have enough information to feel statistically confident. We'll put it that way. So let me let me start in Florida, where I have to say this was one of the most straightforward sets of essays I have seen in decades, not just years, decades. And I was really pleased about it. And I think most of our Florida students felt pretty good about it. There were three essays, three sets of multiple choice topics, and it was pretty manageable. In terms of the essays, we had essay number one was a contracts ethics crossover question. Ethics is a typically tested crossover subject in Florida. The contracts question was almost a standard 1L kind of contracts problem. It was nothing particularly sophisticated or difficult to deal with. And uh, really kind of like that question. We did get to see the essays in Florida, and I think they are in our books or about to be in our books. And if you're interested in looking at them, if you're a Florida student, you should see them in your Florida essay book, or you will shortly. This had to do with a contract to purchase a diamond, and then it gets sold and resold. And we got mailbox rule and all the other things. Surprising about that. And then the ethics part of the problem if I recall properly, was about where to put the money in your client trust account. And so again, pretty straightforward. Then the second essay was criminal procedure. And what made this question interesting was that it was a federal criminal procedure. It was not Florida criminal procedure. And I thought, again, it was a pretty manageable question that you should be able to handle pretty easily. It had to do with a, a stop and frisk and pretty straightforward. And really the question had to do with whether or not someone could be charged with drugs found in their pocket or in somebody else's pocket or a backpack or a trunk of a car. And it was search and seizure. Now, it doesn't get more basic than that in Crim Pro. So that was good. And again, it was to be answered under federal rules. The third essay was constitutional law. And I thought maybe they test Florida con law. They didn't. They went to federal constitutional law. And I held my breath when I heard that it was federal con law because the Florida examiners have been very political in their essays over the past few years. But this one was really very 
straightforward. It had to do with social media. And one of the ironies of this question was that while this exam was being given, the week it was being given, the state of Florida was actually arguing in the U.S. Supreme Court on a Facebook social media case in which the Florida legislature had created a law that was designed to uplift conservative voices. Texas had made the same kind of a law, and both of those cases were on oral argument before the U.S. Supreme Court. So I was worried that, oh my gosh, this question is going to be trying to test something that hasn't been decided. But they weren't going that direction. They stayed out of that particular problem and actually just talked about case or controversy requirement under the U.S. Constitution and whether or not it was possible to have a a constitutional violation by banning someone from a public official's Facebook page and then a defamation claim at the end. So it was an interesting question, and but pretty straightforward. I love that because typically Florida goes off to all these weird little nuances and they try to trick people up. When I talked to our Florida students after the exam, they were actually pretty happy about those essays. And I have to agree with them. I thought those were pretty manageable. In terms of the multiple choice questions in Florida, as always, we had Florida civil or criminal procedure. The second category was Florida evidence, and that's a pretty typical topic in Florida for multiple choice. And then the third category was a combination of Florida wills and trusts, Florida trusts having just recently been switched from an essay topic to a multiple choice topic, reasonably straightforward, and our students seemed to feel pretty good about it. We had created a number of Florida trust multiple choice questions for practice. Students seemed to feel like they were well prepared for that. So that was good news in Florida, and we will get those Florida results. They will come April 15th. We'll see what happens there, but I feel really good about that particular exam. I will say that of all the possibilities, the things that the Florida examiners could have tested, this was a pretty nice test. Not to pat myself on the back too hard, but I pretty much called that exam top to bottom. Yay me. <laughs> sometimes my free views work, sometimes they don't. The next jurisdiction I want to talk about is California. That was an interesting exam in California. We had one testing center where the temperature went down into the low 50s. They apparently decided to turn the air conditioning on and uh, people were frozen out. I doubt if the California bar examiners are going to give any credit to anyone at that location testing center, but there is some question about what to do there. People were complaining that it was so cold that they couldn't tight, that their fingers froze up. And it's really unfortunate that something like this would happen. California knows better than that. And the bar examiners really have a higher duty, I think, to make sure that their spaces are working. Nonetheless, the test went on and went on around the state. In terms of the essays, we don't have the questions. They don't get released to us. We have what's reported back to us. I can tell you that what we got reported back was that there was a California community property essay. That's usually a pretty straightforward kind of question, and I was pleased that was one of the topics. Then again, we had constitutional law, and I continue to be surprised that we're getting constitutional law as a testable essay subject, but it was nothing controversial. It was a pretty straightforward question. The third essay was an ethics question, and this was to be answered under California and ABA rules, as they typically do. And while we call this a California ethics topic, it really gets tested under both rules, but this has been pretty much a staple of the exam. Then the fourth essay was in evidence. Again, this is a topic that California says California evidence, but the question was federal rules of evidence. And we had a relatively straightforward evidence question. And then the last topic was in contracts. So no crossovers and all very straightforward kinds of questions. So again, I think that's really good news. Now, the performance test in California was a persuasive document to a legal audience. It was a motion for summary judgment, and it didn't seem to be overwhelmingly difficult for the students that we talked to. California, of course, doesn't release results until very late in the season, usually the last jurisdiction in the country or one of the last. I don't expect to see those results until we get into, I think, I want to say late May. So we're going to talk a little bit about what to do if you're a California bar taker from February 2024. Obviously, California remains the most difficult exam in the country, but I don't think the exam this time was unreasonably difficult. And again, say I pretty much called that exam in terms of the topics that were on the essays. So 
we'll see. But as we talk to our students coming out of the California exam, most of them felt pretty good or as good as you can feel about that test. Then we've got the uniform bar exam. And of course, this is given in more than 40 jurisdictions. So whether you took it in New York or New Mexico, it was the same exam. We had six essays, two performance tests. In terms of the essays, we had a contracts essay question. In second essay was criminal law. It was a double jeopardy question. Again, pretty straightforward. Third essay was in evidence. The fourth was wills. And remember, in the UBE, these are not state-specific, so it's just a generic wills to see the states question. And then we had property as our fifth essay and partnerships as our sixth. So if you break it down, we actually had four multi-state subjects, contracts, crim, evidence, and property, and only two of the UBE subjects. That is exactly what I predicted. There you go. It went pretty straightforward. I hate to say this, I don't recall the performance test breakdown here on this exam, and I will get that for us next time we're talking. But as we talk to our UBE students around the country, seem to be pretty upbeat. And I got to say, after so many exams where people were just feeling really defeated, particularly in February exams, I was really pleased with the reaction that we got from students. So that's what we're hearing. Now, UBE results start to come out in some small jurisdictions, probably in the next 10 or 11 days, by the end of the month. We get some bigger jurisdictions like New York and Texas later in the season. So we'll keep you informed as all of those results come out. That's what we know basically about the exam. Again, as I say, in Georgia, I just didn't get enough responses to be confident yet about what those topics were, but we'll get back to you as we get more information. Tracy, what's your take as you listen to students coming back from the February exams? Anything in particular? I think they were pretty positive that the exams were pretty straightforward. I think what it shows is that you and your 30 plus years of experience have a pretty good handle on what's going to be tested and what might not be. The best solution always is to be prepared on all of the subject areas and not to try to guess yourself but just to be ready to go. Yeah, I think so. And I was really pleased. There are exams where I do feedback with students after the exam, and it's just like a a funeral march, right? People just are feeling really beat up and feeling like they got surprised and, and ambushed during the exam. For the most part, that really didn't happen here. I think part of what's happening, I think there's two things going on here. The first is, the entire bar examiner community has got their focus on this next set of exams, the next generation exams, or their version of that in Florida, California, and Georgia. Ultra sophisticated or clever or tricky or difficult right now. They just don't have the energy or the bandwidth to put into that. And certainly the NCBE had played this very straight, I thought, on this exam. As we, as Tracy, as you and I have been working with the NCBE, and watching what's coming with next gen, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, I got the very clear impression that the way that they're viewing the existing exam is just hold things steady for the next year or two and not make a lot of big changes in what they're calling the legacy exam. Was that your impression? Absolutely. I think they have decided not to try to be clever, not to try to create something new, but to just go along the same continuum and really put their efforts into the next gen. Yeah, and I think that there's probably a corollary in Florida and California for sure, and I think Georgia to some extent as well, where they're just trying to figure out what their exam will look like when the multi-state bar exam sunsets in, what is it, 2028? And so I get the feeling that instead of trying to create a crazy exam in 2024, they're probably putting their energy into what do we do when we don't have the legacy bar exam anymore? And that's probably good news. Now, the way I see that is that this creates a window of opportunity from July, 2024 until sometime in 2028, probably February of 2028. I think we're going to see the most stability that we've seen in the bar exam, probably in 20 or 30 years. I just don't think there's much desire or commitment to trying to do, as you say, new things in the legacy exam. I think they're just going to stay where they are and stay pretty consistent. 
Plus, there's so much pressure on the bar examiners nationally to start making this exam fairer and more equitable. And given that, I just don't think there's the uh, political will to make crazy exams. So we'll see. This could have been an aberration, but we saw it across the country. And when we get UBE, California, Florida, and I'll tell you in Georgia, even though I can't tell you subjects, it was very much the same approach that it wasn't a, an insane exam. That is unusual. In my years of doing this, there's usually at least one or two of those jurisdictions that go completely off the wall. So if you've been thinking about, should I be trying to take the bar exam now or wait three or four years to take it under next gen? I'm going to tell you unequivocally, sit for the exam right now. This is the best bar exam taking environment that I can remember. And I think that's part of the reason why. So we'll see. But really, if you're sitting for the July 2024, the February 2025, I think you're in for a very straightforward experience. Any other sort of concluding thoughts about the February exam at this point? No, I think that you covered it. Okay, great. Let's talk next about the next gen. You want to talk about next gen? Sure. Tracy's been our point person and will be our point person working with the rest of our team on preparing for the exams that are called the next generation bar exam. And Tracy, let me turn this to you for just a minute because there's a rollout of the next generation exam and it's different in different jurisdictions, correct? It is different in different jurisdictions. Some feel like they're going to be ready to go by July of 26th. But we've seen it go out as far as two more years, July of 2028. So it's right. very hard to predict it at this point. And what we know right now is that I think we have how many jurisdictions that have committed to the next generation? 17. 17. But this is the interesting part. None of them are large jurisdictions. We are still waiting to hear what New York, Texas, two of the UBE jurisdictions are going to do. We don't know what Florida is going to do or California. Florida has pretty much indicated they're not going to do the next gen. We think California is not going to do it either. We don't know about Georgia. They've been very quiet, but we simply aren't hearing from the big jurisdictions. So far, these are all relatively small jurisdictions that are committing and they're committing on different dates, correct? Yes. So the most recent jurisdiction to announce in the next generation exam was Washington State, but we had several others just before that. Colorado and Minnesota this week. And so what's the first date that states are potentially picking up the next gen? Maybe July of 2026. Okay. And then the latest date is July of 2028. So you can see you've got a two-year window in there in which some states will give the existing UBE called the legacy at that point. Some will give the next generation exam. Some will be giving something completely different. So we are looking at potentially three broad categories of exams over that two-year period, but Florida's exam won't be California's or Georgia's. So really we've got probably something on the order of five, six, or more. New York or Texas could go on and do their own exams rather than the next generation. Yep. So Tracy, let's just talk about, for people that don't know, what the next generation exam is generally and what makes it different than the legacy exam. Okay. Yeah. Let's take a look at some slides we've prepared that might help us describe for you what's going to happen. So the next gen exam is going to be a sit down and take exam as far as we know. It will be more practically oriented. It will be an exam where you have to work both in the substantive topics that you're used to, plus a couple more, and some are going to phase in later. But you're also going to have to do the work that would be expected of a one to three year experienced attorney and private practice. So you're going to be looking at things like client interviewing, mediation and conflict resolution, and case management. Here, you're going to see, we're going to have the multiple choice, which you're used to already in the MBE questions. And that's going to be 50% of the exam time. This exam time is three hours less than the current bar exam in the UBE jurisdictions. So they're going to be more compact. What they're going to do is uh, do an MBE type exam, except you could have up to six choices for your answers. 
And some answers will have only one right answer, and some they'll ask you to pick two correct answers. So it could be a wild ride there. We don't have too many prototype questions yet, not enough to really tell you what's going to happen there, but that's our best understanding. Then there's going to be what they call integrated question sets, and that's going to be 30% of the exam time. They're going to give you one fact scenario, one case scenario that comes into your law office. And in that case scenario, you're going to have multiple choice questions and short answer questions. And that's about 30% of the case of the exam. And then you're going to have longer writing tests. Again, on that same fact pattern, there'll be two of those that you'll be tested on. And that's going to be 25% of what happens in the exam. So very different from what it is now. You're not going to have the essay exams that sit by themselves in subject matter jurisdiction. They're all going to relate to this one fact pattern that you have in front of you in the one time block that you have. It's a very different way of taking the exam, but in some ways I think, Jackson, it's going to be easier because you're going to be working with one fact pattern, one set of statutes, one set of cases, one set of facts. And you may, within that pattern, have what you're used to seeing in the MPTs. You may have deposition transcripts. You may have trial testimony. You may have memos that have been written. You may have documentary evidence that you have to analyze. And we hate this term, but you're going to have to issue spot. So we're going to be teaching you how to do this with FLA form. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I think one of the significant pieces here is that it's a shorter test, nine hours versus 12 hours of testing. And just so people understand, we are working with NCB, getting prototype questions, getting more information, understanding more about how the grading will happen. There's a lot that's unknown. We just did a, a webinar that the NCB held for providers, and they answered a lot of questions, but they left a ton of questions unanswered. And so... This is an ongoing process. What I will tell you is that uh, Tracy is leading our team. We are working diligently on the next generation exam. We will have materials ready well in advance of that test for those who want to take it. Once it starts to roll out, if you decide you want to roll into a jurisdiction that's going to give it, great, let's talk about it at that point. But between now and then, the legacy exam, I think, is going to be clearly in a more manageable format. We got 50 years of experience accumulatively in our uh, company of dealing with this exam, and we know how to prepare you for it. So I know that some of you are frustrated with the existing exam, but really, I still think that's a better alternative than holding off for a few years and then trying to get into the next generation exam. So that's what we know about it. We did a podcast, Tracy and I did a podcast where we went through in detail the next generation exam. You can find it on our website and you can find it on YouTube and check that out if you want a a more detailed explanation. Now, along with the next generation exam, as states are beginning to announce that they are making the decision to jump into that and when they are, we had some other bar exam news this week coming out of the state of Washington. Washington is currently a uniform bar exam jurisdiction uh, with a passing score of 270. They announced this week that they have reduced their threshold score to 266. That's good news. Those four points make a difference. That puts them in line with New York and Illinois and a number of major jurisdictions. And so that was good news. But then the other piece of news from Washington State is that they proved a path to licensure that does not include the bar exam. And that makes them either the second or third state in the country to offer such a program. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about this as well, because I've already gotten some questions from people saying, do I need to take the bar exam? Couldn't I just use this alternative path to licensure? It's in Oregon and Washington. I do think there's a third state, but I can't off the top of my head recall which one it is. Nonetheless, Oregon and Washington just approved these programs. And when I looked into the fine print, the details in Washington state, like Oregon, I have to tell you that the devil's in the details. In order to qualify for these programs, you have to have gone through an ABA accredited law school, and then you have to be practicing 
in that state. That is, you've got to be a resident in Washington state or in Oregon state, and you've got to do about eight months worth of legal work for a member of the bar in that state. So you got to find an attorney that's willing to hire you and have you work for them. And then you have to submit a portfolio of work. Then after all of those pieces in the portfolio are done, and it's going to take you about eight months to complete that, it looks like, then there's another fairly lengthy period of evaluation by the bar examiners. And this is one of the really weird parts to me, Tracy. Nobody, Washington or Oregon, has explained how they're going to evaluate your portfolio. Is it just submit it and we'll make a decision? Great. Thanks. How are we supposed to do that? And they don't even know what kinds of work they want to see yet, much less how they're going to evaluate it or grade it. But after some period of time, they'll evaluate it and they'll say, yes, you're in or no, you're not. That's a little challenging. And so you're really looking at a year or more, I think, to get through that program versus just sitting for a bar exam in, say, in July of 2024. The bar exam is passable in both of those states. And you don't have to be living in Washington state to go take the UBE there or in Oregon, same thing. But you do have to be there if you want to do this licensure or alternative path to licensure. State of California is looking at a similar program. They don't know how to do it logistically. They don't know how to evaluate it. They don't know what the timeframes would be. And frankly, I'm not sure that the existing bar in California is all that excited about taking on non-licensed members and having them do work. And then you've got the other problem, which I know, and I'll say it this way. When I started my legal work, I was working for Tracy and I did a lot of work, but you were responsible for it. Tracy. That's right. Yep. And we're not going to do anything with it because it's got to be pure for the purposes of giving it to the bar examiners. I can't imagine you ever doing that. I can't imagine you saying, okay, my hands are off. I'm not going to touch it. But if you did touch it, then it becomes a tainted piece of work. So what do we do then? So I guess my point is that while I'm excited about the idea that there are new ways of thinking about licensing people for the bar, I'm not sure that this is a well thought out plan yet. And I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of understanding about how this is going to work or if it's even really feasible. So I suspect what's going to happen is we'll have a couple of states that will try it. They'll try it for a few years. We'll see what happens. And then if they can figure out a way to do it, maybe we'll see it expand. But I wouldn't hold your breath for it. What's your thought about this? That's what it seems like to me. I don't know how you examine it. I don't know an attorney that is at all cautious or cares about their bar license to just let someone go off on their own because you have to prove that it's your work. It can't be collaborative work. So I think, and I think it's also rife with the opportunity for cultural bias, demographic bias. And so I'm, I'm not a fan at this point. I'd have to see a lot more before I could sign on to it. What I think is important for you all to hear from us today is that we're up on all of these things as up as we can be on all of these new things that are happening. And you don't have to be to the extent that we do. And we'll be there. We're going to be working hard on the next gen exam course preparation. We're still working hard and always improving the legacy exam course for you. We're still going to have all the opportunities for you to get personal help and attention. So whichever path you choose, we're going to be there for you at CBR and help you get over that bar. Yeah. I think that's a good transition to talk about the July 2024 exam. We are now just outside of 130 days until that exam. And that might seem like a very long time to you. It might seem like a very short period of time, but that's the window, typically a little bit more than four months until the exam. And so we use this as our kickoff point to start talking about that exam and really beginning to focus on it. Obviously, we get results from the February exam and people roll in from our course and others as they get those results. But if you are already registered for the July 2024 exam, this is the time the checkered flag is about to drop. And this is the time to begin your studies. My general recommendation to our students is to be at about 15 to 20 hours a week at this point in time. Now, you may ramp that up as you get closer, but if you are working 15 to 20 hours a week right now in our course, you're on track for the July exam. 
Where I get a little bit nervous is when I hear someone say, I'm only going to put in five hours or 10 hours a week right now, or I'm not going to start studying until, and then they give me April 15th or May 1st or some other date based on their situation. My favorite thing to say is that July Jackson will appreciate that March Jackson started studying. There's really no substitute for getting underway and beginning to do your work. And that's why our course materials are available to you already. If you are a February 2024 bar taker, we did not remove your access to the course. It's still there. And if for some reason you felt like you needed to be studying, you certainly could do that and do a little bit of study and picking up for that group. But if you are a coming into the July 2024 exam, you know that's the test you're taking. This is the time to get underway. Now, to support you with that, we've got our group coaching calls, which will begin again in April. We've got our community group. We're obviously doing the live Q&A, but we also have a number of other programs and tools available to you. We've got workshops on essay writing, workshops on performance tests, workshops on the MBE. We have mindset coaching with June. We have, what am I forgetting? Time reaction. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on there to help you get underway and get ready. In addition to that, we've just created a new product offering that I wanted to talk about. It's called the Video Critique Service. For years, I've had students ask me, do you grade essays? And my answer has always been, no, I don't, because I don't think it's the most effective way to learn, and I still believe that. Nonetheless, I've become more aware that we've got to give additional feedback to people as they're starting to work through the course and, or at least offer that option. And so what we did was to create a package in which you can submit up to 15 pieces of writing, essays, performance tests, send them to me, and I will make a three to five minute video for you of my critique of that piece of writing. Now that's not a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. I wanna be very clear, very different than that. You're sending me work, I'm doing a video and sending it back to you. You will see that option to add that to your course in your online course. And if you're feeling like, I need some feedback, but I really don't want to do a full-on coaching package, this is an option for you. It's less expensive. I think it's $850 for the package of 15 coaching or video critiques. The nice part about this, like so many of our other products, is that you can use our third-party buy now, pay later programs, Klarna, Firm, and Afterpay. And you can pay for this over a period of months or even a year. And I would encourage you, if you don't feel like you need the one-on-one -on -one coaching with your writing, but you want feedback, this is a great way to get it. So you'll see that option. And if you need more information, you can always just shoot us an email. If you're already an existing student in our course, we've sent you an email with an example of one of these video critiques so that you can see what it looks like. I'm excited to get underway and start to do those. And uh, I think it's going to be an interesting approach. What's your thinking about that, Trace? I think it's very generous of you actually to offer that kind of time. That's quite a bit of critique, really. And 15 essays, you can get through all of the subject matter courses. And then you can go back and target your difficult ones and see how you're doing with the Jackson taking a consistent and he's hard about his critiques. Let me just tell you, he's not going to sugarcoat things. If you're not doing your work, you're going to have that told to you very clearly, but he's also going to be able to give you the consistency. So I'm anxious to see how this program rolls out, Jackson. Yeah, I am. I'm too. Now, just to be clear, you can still do individual coaching with Tracy, with Amanda, with Brianna, or with me. We think that makes a big difference. We'd like you to be doing that, but we recognize that for some people, it's either they feel like it's not necessary or it's not affordable for them. So this is another alternative, something else that you can check out. In any event, make sure you take a look at that. And if you've got questions, let us know. All right. Having said all that, in the remaining time, Tracy, I want to talk about what really gets me excited, which is our live boot camp coming up April 26th and 27th here in Denver. And one of the things that makes me really excited about this boot camp is that we have more coaches who will be here live to do instruction than I've ever had in the decade that I've been doing boot camp. 
Amanda's going to be here. Brianna's going to be here. June's going to be here. Tracy, you're going to be here. And I'm going to be here as well. This is really cool, isn't it? That we get to have all the coaches here in a small group setting to work with a limited number of students. It is exciting. And we're going to also offer a new topic that we haven't offered before, which is taming your super ego. So I'll be developing that participatory workshop within the larger workshop. We have a small number of students that come to boot camp by design. You have to apply to come. You can come if you've been before. If you took the exam just recently and you know that you probably didn't pass it, what do you have to do? You have to step up your study. And maybe the way you do that is through boot camp coming and getting one-on-one personal attention from all of the coaches on all of the topic areas that you're going to need for the exam. We're going to have a breakout group with just a couple of people working with Amanda on writing. We're going to have a breakout group with just a couple of people at a time working with Brianna on time management. We're going to have a breakout group with June on how to calm your chaotic mind. And then we're going to have the larger group presentations. Jackson's going to teach you how to do photo reading, or if you already are a photo reader, how to improve your photo reading. Jackson's going to show you how to do a mind map and work with you on your mind maps. And we're also going to have a topic area on taking the MBE. So yeah, lots and lots of help for you available there. It's affordable and We want to have you come. We still have a few spots left. And one of the things that we decided to recognize that results will only be out in Florida and a few small UBE jurisdictions by the time of boot camp. So if you are a February 2024 bar taker, here's the offer that we're making to you. If you come to boot camp and then your results come out after boot camp, if you are successful, we will refund your boot camp tuition. You'll still pay for your travel and your hotel and those things, but we're going to give you back your tuition. If you were not successful, then you've had the ability to start your studies, to, to ramp them up, to get ready and to pass in July of 2024. Now that, that, and I got to tell you, not everybody on the staff agreed with my decision to do that, but I really felt we needed to give you as much flexibility as we could. We're taking the risk there, but we'd be thrilled to give you back your money after boot camp if you pass the exam. Now, I will say if you pass and we give you back your money, then I want you to do an interview with me. But short of that, we think this makes it a relatively low risk opportunity for you to get the boot camp coaching. One of the things that I know for having done boot camps for over 10 years is that the people that come to boot camp pass the bar exam. And it, 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 there's just no getting around that. It is, I don't know if it's a chicken or egg problem. I don't know if it's the motivated people that pass or it's the people that came to boot camp and then got the tools that they needed. I think it's a little bit of both. But the ability to be in this small group environment that Tracy was describing and to be with other really motivated bar takers is a huge advantage in my view. And I think the connections that people make with other students and the personal connection they make with the coaches is a massive boost to the work that they're doing. We certainly get to know you better. We get more engaged in what you're doing. We understand what you're doing. It's not just sit back and listen for two days. You are going to be working, but you come out of this understanding how to photo read, how to mind map. You will have done some essay writing and gotten critiqued. You will have done performance test writing, if that's for your jurisdiction, and been critiqued. You will do MBE questions. You will work on mindset. You will learn about the superego. And some of you might be saying, why are they talking about superego? One of the reasons is that as Tracy and I have been working through this superego thing, we're discovering that it is one of the big barriers to success that people have. And as June's been talking to us about mindset, we know that when you apply the growth mindset and you are able to control the superego, that voice in your head that's telling you, I can't do it, or you're a failure, or you're no good. You've just opened up the possibilities of what you can accomplish. And so when you put all that together and then you add time management, all of those pieces, we are giving you the full toolkit in order to be successful. Now, if you're already a photo reader, we're going to discount your boot camp tuition by $400. If you're not a photo reader, we're going to include the full photo reading for the bar exam course. So it's a win-win either way. 
As Tracy said, there is an application process. You need to go to the website in the bootcamp page. You'll see it under resources. And there's a link there and you take a short survey. It's a fully refundable $100 fee to apply. And once we've looked at your answers to the quiz about bootcamp, then you'll get a golden ticket. And the golden ticket allows you to come to the event. There's a lot going on for those two days. There is a lot going on. One of the intangibles is meeting other students and knowing that you're not alone in this process, because this is a very isolating process to study for the bar, especially the way it's done now. So that's a wonderfully connecting and invigorating part of the program. But we provide all your meals for you. We have a lot of fun as well as there's nothing like being able to ask questions right in the moment and get those questions answered. Bringing an essay with you, have it critiqued, and then going back to your hotel room that night and working on it and bringing it back for real-time critique the next day. So it's just so much more immediate and relational. Yeah. And to talk about the fees, boot camp tuition, if you're not a photo reader, is $2,500. You can pay for that in full. Or you can stretch it out over a longer period of time, again, using our Buy Now, Pay Later programs. You'll see those when you go to check out. Your balance isn't due until April 15th, tax day and boot camp day. We've made it as affordable as we possibly can. And really, just the fact that we've got our nearly our entire coaching staff there, I am just so stoked to have everybody there. There's really nothing that matches up with really working with the coaching staff in person. We're really thrilled to be able to do this. I know Brianna and Amanda are excited. We had Amanda at the last boot camp, and people loved working with her. Of course, June and I have been doing this forever. Tracy, you've done a few of them now. So we've got a pretty established group. I will tease you with one thing at boot camp. I am going to be demonstrating something that no one has seen yet in Bar Review, and it is very exciting. It's a technological breakthrough. So there's a lot coming there. And we've got some cool surprises for you. So make sure you jump in. It is limited attendance, limited enrollment, and uh, you don't want to miss it. So please check that out. If you have questions, let us know. Denver is a pretty easy place to get to. Lots of airlines fly in here. Lots of folks, if you're in the Western U.S., you can drive in. And we've got a wide range of hotels in the area. And as Tracy said, we're taking care of the meals. So it's all set up for you. And really... One of the great things when we look back and we say, who passed the bar exam? It is the people that went to boot camp are the people that pass. They're not the only ones, but they do pass. So if you're really ready to pass the bar exam, this is something you can't, I think you can't afford to skip. And you might be saying, I got to spend more money or I got to take time. Look, you're going to lose a day of work. That's probably the most. And, but the change that it'll make in your life to be a member of the bar. I think everybody that's done it would say it's been worth it. One case and you have this old program paid for. Invest in your future. Make that investment and let us know if there's anything we can do to help or if you have any questions. And as Tracy said, if you've been to boot camp previously, you are invited to come back and join us, space permitting. We hope that we will see those people who have not yet had the opportunity to take the exam. I think that's everything that we wanted to talk about. Did I skip anything, Tracy? I don't think so. We just wanted to get back in touch, let you know what's happening in the world of bar exam and let you know what we're working on as we sit by the pool every day in Colorado in the winter. I don't think that's working, especially since we had 20 inches of snow last week. But I'll tell you what, Colorado, the end of April is beautiful. And it's a wonderful place to come and visit if you've never been here. And let us show you our home. Yeah, no, I think that was about it. And we're happy to be in contact with those of you who are with us again today. And those of you who watch us on down the road, we're here for you. Yeah, and absolutely. Reach out. Absolutely. We're looking forward to having June, Amanda, Brian, mm -hmm. Bobka all back when we get into April. And we will start in earnest towards the July exam. We'll also have updates and reports on results as they start to come out across the country. Those of you waiting on your results from February 2024, we wish you the very best and look forward to great stories of success. And one thing we wanted to mention going forward, this will be our time for Q&A. We are moving it 
up in the day one hour. So it's at one o'clock Eastern time and 10 o'clock Pacific time. And if you're watching for the group coaching calls, you'll see those in the events tab in our community group. Those calls will start to roll into place in early April. So make sure you're checking those out. They're included in your course. We really think that's a great resource and hope that you'll participate in those. All right, Tracy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to all of you who are here with us live today. If you're watching us on replay, we're glad to have you with us. And we will be back in April to start talking about the 2024 exams and all the good stuff that's ahead of us. With that, take care, everybody. Have a great rest of your week.